What's up, YouTube? This is Too Raw for Sports. Let me say this before I get into this video. I admire Julius Irving as a basketball player, and uh, I think he's one of the great ambassadors the game has ever seen. Um, I think it's an argument to be made that he is at least the second greatest small forward we've ever seen. We can make that argument. Especially if you, if you include his ABA career, um, I think you can make the argument that he is historically perhaps the most important basketball player that we've seen, um, at least in the last 40 to 50 years. And a video can be made about that. I'm not saying the best, I'm just saying important as to how the game evolved from the 60s and then the 70s and 80s. You see, he's very important. He's the link between two leagues, one defunct, one thriving now where players are making so much money that they don't have to show up to work. But anyway, uh, look, I'm talking about Julius Irvin, of course, and a lot of people link Julius Irvin and Michael Jordan. You know, they both were high flyers, both were great scorers, both became ambassadors of the NBA. But one can make an argument that Julius Irvin, if anything, kind of had a cold uh, view of Jordan in a lot of ways. He once referred to Michael Jordan as, quote, a mini version of myself. Mini version. But mind you, Michael was maybe when he first came to the league, maybe 6'5, 190. Julius Irvin, 6'6, 2'10. Two, I mean, it's not that big a difference. And shoes, 6'6 six, six to 6'7. Six, I mean, whatever. But I always felt that Julius Irvin resented Michael Jordan in a lot of ways. You know, and I'll tell you why. <clears throat> Julius Irvin, as popular as he was, reached his zenith probably in the ABA. In the ABA, he was like Michael Jordan. He carried the ABA. The ABA probably would have folded maybe two years Sooner, had it not been for the exploits of Julius Irvin. And when you look at the ABA, he won three, what, three ABA titles, I believe it was. MVPs and all of this. I mean, he was just a phenomenal uh, player in the ABA. In the NBA, even though people always give Magic and Larry the praise, and they should give them the praise, Julius Irvin was the guy, was the guy that was carrying the lead, like at least keeping it afloat. He was that one marketable star that they had. They had a lot of stars, but they weren't marketable. Kareem was mercurial. Rick Barry was an asshole. Uh, Bob McAdoo, you know, just wasn't that type of guy. They had great guys that could put the ball in the basket. Like, you know, they had guys like um, Elvin Hayes. And, you know, they had guys like, uh, <clears throat> like you know, Lloyd, uh, Lloyd soon to be world be free. They had great guys that could shoot, score. The late Freeman, Freeman Williams and all these other guys, man. You know, Calvin Murphy. A lot of great players that could score. But or, or just for stars, West Unsell, but they weren't marketable. The doctor was marketable. But then Michael Jordan comes several years later, and he just takes over the fucking league and eclipses Julius Irvin in popularity. What took Julius Irvin 15 years to build, Jordan eclipsed in like two or three years. When Dr. J was giving his swan song in 86, 87, you know, don't get me wrong, that was a great 
you know, final campaign for Julius Irvin. But by that time, he was an intern, averaging maybe 14, 15 points a game. Jordan was blasting the league, averaging 37. Everyone was calling this guy already the greatest player we've ever seen. Bob Cousy, who three years prior, when the Boston Celtics had beat the Lakers, was calling Larry Bird the greatest player this game has ever seen. By 87, he was saying Michael Jordan was the best player we've ever seen. Jordan only played three seasons. You don't think this guy's under Julius Urban's skin? Not to mention the fact that uh, as great as Dr. J was, and he was great, many people saw his game as being incomplete. And what I, what I mean by that is, well, the way that people get on guys who don't shoot threes very well now, back then people got on you if you didn't have a mid-range game. At least have a mid-range game. The doctor could knock him down, but he did not have a dependable, consistent mid-range game. Like Alex English developed, you know, like you know, some other players developed. He, he didn't have that. So some people considered him a bit incomplete. Michael Jordan would go on to, be, to not only develop a mid-range game, he developed at least a decent three-point game. When you look at it, Michael was a better defender. Michael was a better three-point shooter. Michael was a better mid-range shooter. Michael was even more absurdly athletic than Dr. J. He was even more creative. Would you know his level of creativity eclipsed that of Julius Irving as far as dunks and in-game uh, machinations? He was a more dominant scorer, and ultimately, he won more. So much so that by the time of Michael Jordan's second to last season in the league, and I'm talking about before the original retirement, most people, 95 percent, would tell you. He was better than Julius Irvin already. Michael Jordan had done in eight seasons more accomplishment wise than Julius Irvin had done in 16, including the ABA years. With the exception of the fact that. The doctor had, I believe, what, three championships and four MVPs? I got to look at those numbers again. Mike had two MVPs, no, three MVPs and two championships. But as far as overall accomplishments, Mike was ahead of him. Then when he won the third one, it was a no-brainer. He was better. And it is interesting, when Mike came back in 95, do you know who was one of the most vocal uh, opponents of him coming back? The doctor. The doctor said, nah, he shouldn't come back. Uh, why, why give up your freedom? You know, why, why, why go back to all this nonsense? Why? Because maybe you don't want him to add to his legacy. You don't want him to already keep adding to what he already did. And I remember... When, Doc, when Dr. J was an analyst on NBC back then, he was one of the main people pushing Grant Hill to stop being defer, deferential to Mike. You, you can be the best player in the league. Stop being deferential to Mike. So at the end of the day, what I'm saying is, I think he's always sort of resented uh, Michael Jordan. As a matter of fact, you can make an argument. I know a lot of people listening to this channel don't like, Julie, uh, don't like LeBron James. I understand that. But remember, he didn't even have LeBron on his second all team. That's a, that's a disgrace now. He's always done that, Dr. J. He's always uh, romanced and romanticized, excuse me, the players that he grew up watching in the 60s and belittled those who come after him. Now, don't get me wrong. I love to give homage to the players of the past. I don't think they should be just thrown away. But I don't just automatically think they're better because they just played back then and I grew up and I admired them. So, yes, 
Julia Servin, in my opinion, has always sort of had a, you know, acrimonious relationship with certain players. Uh, I think he has been jealous of Michael Jordan. That's just my opinion. Tell me what you guys think. 